Okay. Good morning. Oh, greetings to you in the name of the Lord. It's great to see you all on this second Sunday of Easter. Actually, if I turn around, I'll see even more of you. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's kind of weird having so many people up there, but it's really wonderful. Thank you all for uh, for doing so. This morning, uh, we're having something a little different. And I'm glad that you're here for it. Uh, if you would, please fill out the attendance register, pass that along to the folks next to you. Those of you who are joining us via the internet, on Facebook or YouTube, uh, is there some reason why this is vibrating? Echoing, yeah. Ah, there we go, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, those of you who are joining us on Facebook and and YouTube, thank you for doing so, and I uh, hope you see something here this morning that would, uh, that would uh, prompt you to join us here, live and in person, in the near future. 
Uh, as far as announcements are concerned, uh, it's basically a normal, a normal week. Uh, session meets this evening. Other than that, uh, not a lot that's different, so take note of what's there. As far as the service today is concerned, uh, this was referred to me uh, as, a, um, as a mini cantata. And it's e even being done in a way that's different from, from what I've ever seen cantatas done before. Uh, of course, the, it's all thematic because that's one of the things that makes, makes a cantata uh, having to do with the, the, uh, the passion and resurrection of Jesus. But instead of it all being one 30 or 45 minute uh, block of music, it's spread throughout, throughout the service. And as a result of that, uh, there's not as much singing by the congregation uh, this morning. So uh, you can rest your voices until the end. The last song actually will not be a sir, I Serve a Risen Savior. We will hold that until a week uh, to come. Uh, the last song will be Christ is Risen. You'll be asked to join in on that, and for that, the screen will come down. Uh, the screen will stay up until then, simply in order to be able, enable us to hear them better. Uh, having that up makes a big difference. So, um, so less singing by the congregation, more by the choir today, and uh, hopefully that will be a blessing to you. Uh, I'll also mention just so you know, this is also a bit unusual. I'm starting a uh, summer, my normal after Pentecost series uh, isn't waiting until Pentecost. Uh, instead, I'm starting it today. So we will be going through the Book of Romans from now through the end of the summer. I think that is everything. I just noticed the lilies are gone. Are they still here? Yeah, something else, sir. Hmm? Mother daughter sign Oh, yes, thank you very much. I will mention that. Uh, are the have the lilies simply been removed? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, there is a uh, sign up sheet in the back uh, for those of you ladies and uh, possibly daughters well, and daughters, who uh, would like to attend. That's going to be on the Saturday before Mother's Day, which is May 13th. 13th. Yes, at what time? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Uh, so uh, if you are interested in, in coming, if you'd like to come, uh, that will be up there for the next couple of weeks. It would be tremendously helpful uh, for Linda and those who are putting that together uh, to know how many folks are going to be coming for that. All right, if there is nothing else, thank you, Linda, for, for mentioning that, reminding me of that. If there's nothing else, let's worship the Lord.
Good morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are present in this place today, that you are King of kings, that you are Lord of lords, and Father, we have joined here today to worship you, to honor you, to glorify you. God, we ask that today, that as we hear your word saying that, God, that we would celebrate the resurrection of your Son. God, we pray that as we hear your word preached, that, Father, that it would penetrate to bone and marrow, that it would change us, that it would move us, that it would build faith in us, that we may become more like your Son. God, we thank you for this, and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a humble donkey. Although thousands cheered him on that Palm Sunday, Jesus would defy their political expectations. The Jews were looking for a Messiah who would free them from the tyranny of their Roman oppressors. But Christ would deliver them from enemies who were far more powerful, sin, death, and hell itself. So Jesus came not as a victorious conqueror, but rather as the humble Lamb of God, determined to lay down his life for ours.
Let us pray. Most gracious Lord Jesus Christ, in your resurrection, the heavens and the earth rejoice. By your resurrection, you broke open the gates of hell and destroyed sin and death. By your resurrection, you raised the dead and brought us from death to life. By your resurrection, you confounded your guards and executioners and filled the disciples with joy. By your resurrection, you proclaimed good news to the women and apostles and brought salvation to the whole world. Lord, we no longer look for you among the dead, for you are alive and have become the Lord of life because God so loved the world. And we thank you for that. Even as we make this confession of faith, we're forced to recognize that your kingdom has not yet come in its fullness. And we pray for its soon arrival and your return. Because the powers of darkness continue to plague humanity, even though defeated, we offer our intercession today on behalf of those in need. We pray for refugees, for tortured prisoners, for the innocent victims of war. We pray for our brothers and sisters suffering throughout the Middle East, North Africa, and elsewhere in the Muslim world. In China, in Eritrea, in Nigeria, and in places all across the globe. We pray for the people around the world and for all the countless people in our own country who live day to day in poverty, in homelessness, in hunger, and disease, both physical and mental, asking for your healing and your provision for them. Here in this congregation, there are also many needs. We pray for the widows and widowers who celebrate this season of resurrection for the first time without a beloved spouse who's died since last we observed this holy time asking for your comfort and your assurance of resurrection for them. We pray for those who are sick this day, or who are worried about a loved one who is ill. And we lift up those who are recovering from surgery or illness, particularly uh, Gary Meyer and John Lutz, whom we're delighted to see here this morning, though we know that his recovery still has a way to go. We pray for Anita Harris as she continues her recuperation from stroke in Cape Girardeau. And we pray for Luke Lyerla's father as he deals with a variety of physical ailments, most recently infection. And in each instance we ask that you would be at work in their bodies and in their spirits to bring them full recovery. We thank you, Lord, for family and for friends, and we ask that you would grant them a special blessing by your spirit as we encounter nothing short of your very self here this morning. May we know for certain that we have indeed been in your sacred presence, and may this encounter in turn embolden us to live an Easter life, a resurrection life, a holy life, not only now, but also in all the days to come and forevermore. For it is in your holy and magnificent name that we ask it, even as we pray together in one heart and voice, as you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May we continue with the presentation of our tithes and offerings. The Apostle Paul wrote the church in the Greek town of Philippi and described what Jesus did in these beautiful verses. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2, 6 through 8.
us pray. Gracious Father, your Son's passion and resurrection are our victory, and we thank you for that. Thank you that because he has died and lives again, we may live with him. Father, we bring these gifts to express our gratitude, and we ask that you would use them, bless them, empower them to go forth in your name, to spread the gospel of your Son, and that you would use us as the givers to do so as well. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul continues his description. The Apostle Paul continues his description of what God did through Christ at the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 9 through 11.
Our epistle lesson is Romans 1, 1 through 17. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his promise, prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, though whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome, you are loved by God and called to be the saints. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Christ Jesus. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you. I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Jesus was not only resurrected he is the resurrection. Jesus is not only alive, he is life itself. And because he paid our debt of sin on the cross, we can have life for now and for eternity. If you've never accepted this free gift of salvation, then Easter can be your resurrection day as well. Hear God's invitation to new life and simply say yes.
<clears throat> they've been doing a lot of standing. You have not. So if you would please stand <laughs> for the reading of the gospel, which comes to us this morning from the gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the, other's disciples, the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the, his hand, in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you have, may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be, be to God. God. Please be seated. Forty-six years ago, back in the dark ages, uh, back Sophie, before, before color TV, before the internet, before there was writing. <laughs> 46 years ago, I took up a challenge from someone who cared a great deal about me, who has since had doubts, and read the Bible through. By the time I had finished the Gospels, many people would have said that I was already a Christian because I believed what I read about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. But I'm not sure that I really was a Christian at that point. I was still, in a very real sense, on the outside looking in, wondering, what does it all mean? What difference does it make to me? Was this something that someone Jewish could be part of and still remain part of the people of Israel? It wasn't until I got to the book of Romans that it all became clear to me. And in that regard, I'm a lot like countless people through the ages. If one is truly to understand the Christian faith, it's necessary to understand Romans. If one is going to be able to pass that faith along to others, it's necessary to understand Romans. If one is going to be able to truly live out our faith as God has intended, it's necessary to understand Romans. And that's why this summer's study, which is long enough that I needed to start the Sunday after Easter instead of uh, after Trinity Sunday, which I normally do, uh, this summer study is going to be in the book that many commentators call the heart and key to the gospel. It's a letter that's often overlooked by those who want to treat it simply as a, theo a theology textbook or even an ethics textbook. It was written for a specific occasion. Paul was preparing for a visit that he intended to make uh, that would be his first 
to Rome, verses 11 through 13 say, 11 and 13 say, that, that he very much wants to visit them. Uh, he's been through the Holy Land. He's been through Syria. He's been through Asia Minor and into, Tur- and into Greece. Uh, but he hasn't yet been to the heart of the Roman Empire, and that's where he wants to go. He wants to go there to visit a Christian community uh, in, there in Rome that was mixed, unlike was the case in some places uh, where there were only Jews or only Gentiles. In Rome, the congregation was mixed. It consisted of both. And this, is, this epistle is about our salvation in Christ uh, seen through the lens of the Jewish Christian or the Jewish uh, Gentile question, verses 16 and 17. Uh, with that expression to the Jew first and also to the Greek, indicates that that's going to be part of his primary focus. And I think that's probably part of the reason why Romans spoke to me so well and, in fact, speaks to everyone so well. It's not meant just for Jews, just for Gentiles. It's meant for both. It's meant for all of the people that God is calling into his kingdom. And so with it being a mixed congregation, he's going to take a look at our salvation through that lens. He explains why salvation is necessary. As a matter of fact, some people think he goes on way too long with that part of it, but every bit of it's necessary. And he explains why it is that it comes through Israel. Why the Jews, the, um, the old, the old um, I don't think it's a nursery rhyme, but, but the old rhyme, uh, how odd of God to choose the Jews, uh, expresses the idea that I think many Gentiles have probably had. Why this inconsequential people from the middle of nowhere? Why should they have been the ones through whom salvation would come? Uh, why not uh, a, a mighty important people like, for instance, the Romans, uh, wouldn't that have made more sense? Paul wants, wants to deal with that. He also explains the relationship uh, of Christians, Jews and Gentiles alike, to the Mosaic law uh, and the relationship between faith and works in the law. This is really important because one of the questions, perhaps the most important question, that the early church debated uh, was that relationship between faith and works and the Mosaic law and do Gentiles have to become Christians, uh, have to become Jews in order to become Christians. Does, uh, does anyone here like barbecue? Does anyone here like uh, shellfish? Okay, you already know why this question is important to you. Uh, If this question had been decided in a different way, uh, you wouldn't be permitted barbecue or shrimp or any of a number of other things that you uh, would love to eat. We would be worshiping on Saturday rather than Sunday, which might not be all that big a deal, certainly not not compared to to barbecue, but still, it would be different. Uh, there are any of a number of things that, that would be very different about the way that we live our faith if the view that Paul presented that he had received by revelation from God and that he laid out in Romans had not prevailed uh, in the church. So that's, that's what we're going to be taking a look at over these next several months. Uh, and Paul begins with an introduction, as I mentioned before. This is He's writing to a very real congregation uh, with, with people who have, uh, uh, they're, they're Greeks, they're Jews. He mentions Mary and Andronicus. and Urbana, Sissus, uh, and, and Tryphena, and Tryphoma, Tryphosa, pardon me, uh, and, and a whole bunch of others. And do we, know, we don't know anything about most of these people, 
except that they were real. He wasn't writing a theology textbook. He was writing to a group of people, which is how I'd like for us to, to read this letter. This is a letter not just to the church of ancient Rome. This is a letter for us, to us, as well as about us. Now, in his greeting, which is the first seven verses, uh, he makes his first reference to what he will deal with more substantially later on. In verse 3, uh, he, he talks about the promises of God that had been given through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, prophets of whom uh, Gentiles would have known nothing before being evangelized, most likely. Uh, and those prophecies were concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh. That's not just a throwaway phrase. It's his, and quite frankly, it, it wasn't to me either. It was the first indication that he wanted to make, uh, make of the first importance for them that their faith didn't originate with them. This is a gift to the Gentiles. It was a gift to the Jews as well, but it was a gift to the Gentiles uh, who previously had not been part of, of God's covenants with human beings, but who now were part of it, but who nevertheless don't come in simply waltzing through the front door. They are, and he talks about this later on, they are adopted into the family of God and become, like Jews, children of Abraham. Okay, the children of Abraham uh, are not just Jewish, they are Gentile in as much as they belong to Christ who was descended excuse me, from David, uh, according to the flesh. He also, again, another theme that he'll come back to frequently, uh, says that, that he is writing uh, um, uh, because he has been set apart as they have been set apart uh, for uh, uh, lives of holiness. In verse 4, he mentions the spirit of holiness, uh, and uh, in verse 5, he mentions uh, the obedience of faith. To bring about, he, Paul's ministry is to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of the name of Christ. So he's making clear right from the beginning, he's not going to be simply uh, dunking on the Mosaic law and saying, well, you, you can ignore this in its entirety now and you can live basically any way you want as long as you have faith. A position which later on received the name antinomianism, uh, anti-against nomos uh, law in Greek. So antinomianism is to be against law. Paul was not against law. He was not against obedience. He was not against works of faith. Okay. That's a caricature. That's not who he was. So right here at the beginning, he talks about the obedience of faith and the way that that's going to be enabled by the spirit of holiness. He then says that he's been looking to come to Rome for a long time. He mentions in verse 11 that he wants to, uh, to impart to you some spiritual gift. And as he makes clear in 1 Corinthians, he actually is not the one who gives spiritual gifts. Those are given by the Holy Spirit. But that that happens uh, in tandem with his preaching and with any preaching. Uh, and spiritual gift can be understood here in the sense of, of an ability or it can be understood in terms of a blessing. He has a purpose for wanting to come to them. He has something he wants to do with them, and particularly that is to preach and to build them up in their faith. Now, that's, that's a very quick overview of the first uh, 15 verses. There's a lot more that could be said, but frankly, I don't have until 2043. So, <laughs> so we're not going to go into every word uh, of Romans. We simply don't have, have time to do so. What we'll do now, however, is come to the theme 
of the epistle, uh, the gospel of salvation, wherein is revealed to us the true righteousness of God. And that's found in verses 16 and 17. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is the good news. And it's that good news that he explains and applies in the rest of his letter. But here, in these two verses, it, uh, it consists in brief of the following. First, it has to do with Christ's incarnation, birth, life, teaching, suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension. That's good news. And the reason it's news is because it's not philosophy. Okay? It's not abstraction. It's not the result of human reasoning. It's news. It happened. Everything I just mentioned, incarnation, birth, life, teaching, suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension, happened. And so the, the gospel that he is bringing to them, good news, is not simply a way of life or the meaning of things. It's what has happened and why what has happened has made a difference. Okay? So he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, all of these things that have happened, for it is the power of God for salvation. And that salvation, as he as he, uh, he, he goes into later on, has to do with the forgiveness of sin. It has to do with freedom from uh, the ceremonial law. It has to do with the defeat of the powers of darkness. Sin no longer having a hold over us. Death no longer having a hold over us. The whole thing that we celebrate at, uh, at, at Holy Week and Easter but again, that's not just the meaning of it. That's what's actually happened. The good news is the power of God for salvation because through what has happened, God has acted. And in the process, as I said last week, he has changed everything. And that salvation uh, is has to do with forgiveness of sins, has to do with liberation from, from the powers, and it has to do with uh, union with Christ achieved through the work of the Holy Spirit. And he goes into that at great length later on. Uh, what that enables us and what the eternal results of that are. And finally, the power to live lives of holiness that flows from all of that. Uh, the life that we have been given is not a life in which we rest on the laurels of what we know to be true. Rather, the events of what happened change our lives and they change the way that we live, the way that we relate to one another, the way that we work, the way that we learn, the way that we play the way that we talk to one another and talk to, and talk to the world. All of that is included in the gospel and in the salvation that flows from the gospel. And it does so, he says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, one thing I want to I make clear here right at the beginning, this does not indicate an order of priority or preference on God's part. God did not choose the Jews as odd as it was. He did not choose them because he liked them better. Okay. Uh, if God uh, ever ate Jewish food, he would know this is not a people to hang around with, at which point he would have chosen the French or the Italians. Okay. Uh, God didn't choose the Jews because they were better people uh, or they were holier or, or more devout 
uh, or more obedient than any other people. He didn't choose them for that reason. And while he says for the Jew first and then for the Gentile, he's not talking about a preference. He's talking about chronology, pure and simple. Jews got it first with Abraham. They got it first with Moses. They got it first with the prophets. All of that leading to Christ. That's the way it happened historically. Once again, we're talking about good news. We're talking about what actually happened. Not God liked them better, but God came to them first. Simply because, I guess, he had to come to somebody. He had to come to somebody. And apparently, he wanted to come to somebody that was not powerful in their own right, or important in their own right, or even particularly holy or devout or obedient in their own right. Instead, he came to an insignificant people in the middle of nowhere in order to demonstrate his power, and that's something that he comes back to over and over again. Now, this, this uh, coming first to the Jew and then to the Greek uh, has to do with the righteousness of God and its revelation, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Um, he, uh, he puts it this way because the gospel of God tells us that our salvation has been secured in a way that is in harmony with God's holiness. He doesn't just dismiss sin or blow it off as inconsequential. He treats it with the utter seriousness that it demands. Um, there are lots of people, you've, you've no doubt heard them, lots of people, uh, modern people, who say, you know, if God really loved us, he wouldn't have had to go through all that Jesus rigmarole. He wouldn't have bothered with the law. No, all of that stuff was inconsequent. He wouldn't have done any of that. He'd have just said, you messed up, I forgive you. Just like that. You all do that with your children, right? Right? <laughs> uh, oh, gee, you, 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 you oh, you only, have a, you only have a learner's permit and you took the car out by yourself and you ran it into a tree. Oh, that's okay, no big deal, right? You haven't done that, Dana? No? Do either of them have, do, they don't have their learning experiments. When, when they do that, are you, is that the way you're going to treat it? Are you going to deal with it? Probably not. <laughs> now, word of warning, ladies. Okay. Parents don't do that. And there's no reason for God to do that. Spouses don't do that. Police and judges don't do that. Nobody does that. And there's a reason for that. Because having been made in the image of God like him, we know that right and wrong, truth and falsehood, justice and injustice matter. And for God to have simply said, ah, well, you, uh, you spit in my face, no big deal. Let's move on would have offended his righteousness, his holiness. Uh, and he simply couldn't do that. It would have been contrary to his nature to do that. And so he, of course, was dealing with a problem. How it is it that I deal with these people's disobedience and faithlessness and unbelief, how do I do that in a way that is harmonious with who I am? In a way that makes clear to them that sin is important 
that sin is consequential, that sin is foreign to me, and at the same time save them from it? Well, that's what Paul is going to explain in the course of his letter. And he says that's how the righteousness of God is going to be revealed. Yes, God is love, absolutely. That's why he's going to go through all of this. But he's also righteous in a way that we can barely conceive of. And all of this is going to be revealed from faith to for faith. From faith for faith. Other versions say from faith to faith. But the idea, the idea is the same. Nobody's going to be argued into this. Okay. That's basically what the Greeks wanted. They wanted to be shown uh, a clear and convincing argument. That's what an awful lot of modern people want. We want either logic or empirical evidence that is irrefutable, then we'll buy what you're selling. And Paul is letting them know right at the beginning, what I am going to explain to you is something that can only be understood by those who already believe in the good news. See, this, this, this letter is not meant to be evangelistic in the sense that we normally think of that. This letter is to Christians informing them about what has happened that has made such a difference in their lives. And I, I, again, I think that's part of the reason why it so resonated with me 46 years ago is because I had the Gospels, I knew what the story was, I thought that the story was true. But I didn't have a clue as to what it meant to me, what difference it made to me. That's what he's going to do. God's righteousness will be revealed, and it will be revealed to those who believe. So prepare in the next few months to perhaps have assumptions challenged, perhaps have old notions challenged. We're going to bring this book to bear for those who believe on what it is that we tell the world and how we live before it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Paul, for your inspiration of his writing, uh, writing to a particular group of people, but also writing to us. We thank you for the gospel and for the salvation that it heralds. And as we continue along through the chapters of this book, our prayer is that you will indeed reveal your righteousness and reveal your love, reveal your grace and your mercy to us through it. That the result might be the transformation of our lives and those with whom we come into contact. Father, we ask all this for the sake of the one who was born, lived, taught, healed, suffered, died, rose again, and who now sits on your right hand, even Jesus Christ our Lord, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Would you please stand for prayer, please? <clears throat> Resurrected Lord, you saw our sin before you made the world. You saw the cross before you poured yourself into human form. And then you allowed your body to be broken, your flesh to be torn, and your blood to be poured out on our behalf. We stand here today with our debt paid in full. Your resurrection is proof of your power and of your promise that one day you will return and restore a new heaven and new earth where we shall live with you forever. Amen and amen. Stay with us. 
and a little bit late for our Easter special. as you depart, receive this benediction from the Lord. May the God of all grace who has raised Jesus from the dead that we may live for all eternity with him go with you and be seen at work in you and through you both now and forever. Amen.